But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the leaven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marvelling at what had happened. Good morning and welcome friends to Covenant Life. We are glad you joined us. This is our Easter celebration 2021 and we're so happy that you could be with us. I don't know how you found us, but we would love to know. So if you get a chance, leave a comment, like, subscribe, do what you have to do to get through to us. And we would love to welcome you into our family, to have you at our church, to have you in our small groups or online. We can connect with you wherever you are. We're here to serve you. So welcome. I hope you have a great time. And I'm looking forward to every song reaching your heart, every word blessing your home. Let's do this. Have a great morning.
As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them, and he was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, blessing God. On a grey April morning, as a chilling wind blew, a thousand dark promises were about to come true. Satan stood trembling, knowing now he had lost, as the Lamb took his first step on the way to the cross. This must be the Lamb, the fulfillment of all God has spoken. This must be the Lamb, not a single bone would be broken like a sheep to the slaughter so silently still this must be the lamb they mocked his true calling and laughed at his face so glad to see the tender one consumed by their hate unaware of the winds there and the darkening sky so blind to the fact that it was God limping by this must be the Lamb the fulfillment of all God has spoken this must be the Lamb not a single bone would be Broken like a sheep to the slaughter, so silently still, this must be the Lamb. This must be the Welcome back. My name is Jeremy Dawson and I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I serve with a church. I pastor a church called Covenant Life, as you've been coming to know. And the purpose of this connection is for you to join us and grow with us. That's what I want. The purpose of this connection to get to know you, to join, and to grow with us. And I hope that you will come. I hope that you will connect with us. And we can serve you wherever you are, online, in a small group, through material that we can send over to you. Or if you can even come and join us on a Sunday morning, nothing like it. So I'm so glad that we have this opportunity. Today I want to celebrate Easter 2021 with you by sharing six reasons for hope that we have greater
greater than anybody else. Hope that we have greater than anybody else. This hope lasts and this hope is grounded in things that were done by God himself so that it will never go away. You get what I'm saying? You have hope that's eternal, hope that is alive, hope that sustains itself. And that's the hope that drives our life. Let me give you the first one. The first one is this, and you'll find it in a little book called Ephesians chapter one, verse seven is where I'm getting this little scripture from. It's on the screen. You can see it. Let me begin by saying we have been completely forgiven. That's the first reason for hope. We have been completely forgiven. This scripture says in Christ, we are set free. In Christ, we are set free. Set free from what? The bondage of penalty of our sin. The bondage of future judgment. The bondage of any fear that we could possibly have of death and beyond. In Christ, we are set free by the blood of his death. And so we have forgiveness of sins. Look at that. And so, because of what Christ has done, not because of something you do, Not because of something I do, not because of what we do for each other, because of what Christ has done. We have, it is ours, forgiveness of sins by the grace of God's uh, riches, by, by his wonderful, rich grace that he has given to us. Let me give you another scripture. This is a little longer. So let me just read it for you. Okay. The book of Isaiah verse 53 verse 6 through 7 uh, says this, all of us have gone gone away. All of us have strayed like sheep. You know that. I mean, we know that, right? We've left God's pathway to follow our own. Yet, God takes everything that's broken about us. God takes our guilt, our shame, our sin, and he lays it on him. That's Jesus. From prison and trial, they led him away to death. That's Jesus. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins? And suffering for their punishment. Who knew that? He had done no wrong. And he had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. Then he was put in a rich man's grave. (laughs) He was born in a poor man's uh, hospital. And he was buried in a rich man's grave. But it was God's plan that it should suffer. No, it wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the soldiers. It wasn't the Jews. it uh, It was God's plan that Jesus should suffer. Because somebody has to suffer for sin. And God chose that he himself would take that suffering. So yet, when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have multitudes of children. You see that on your screen? When he has made himself an offering for sin, he will have lots of children. The father wants all his children back. Let me give you one more scripture. Jesus was handed over to die because of our sins. Not something he had done, but because of our sins. And he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. My friend, if you leave, if you remember nothing from this uh, message today, from this little talk today, remember this. Jesus was handed over to die for our sins because of our sins. And he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. Christianity is about being right with God. Christianity is about having all our sin forgiven. Christianity is about being in Christ. So whatever Christ is, Christ has, is ours forever. And therein lies our hope. You love
another one. We're no longer afraid to die. Yeah, death doesn't scare us. Dying scares us, but death itself doesn't scare us. This is what scripture says. John chapter 11 verse 25 says this, Jesus promised. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Look at that word. I mean, that's what we celebrate at Easter. Resurrection. Nobody else has risen from the dead except Jesus. So, if you want an expert on death and beyond, it's Jesus. If you want to ask any question about life after death, it's Jesus. If you want to know if there is life after death, talk to Jesus. He's available right now. He's alive and well and, and, and wanting to connect with you. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever, he says, believes in me. Whoever puts his faith in me, even though they physically drop to the ground and corrode, they will live again. No matter how damaged they could be, I will raise them again. That is an incredible promise from an incredible savior who himself rose from the dead to prove those words true. Look at this scripture. For 40 days after his death, Jesus appeared to people in many times and many ways. This is a fact 
People saw him. People met him. People ate with him. After his death, this wasn't just some hoax. This wasn't just, oh, you know what? I saw somebody at the mall who looked just like Jesus. I swear, I tell you, I, I swear blind. No it, was, no, it wasn't one of those hoaxes. It was actual many times, many ways. That proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. They remember what he said. They got his instructions and then he took off. This is real, my friends. We are no longer afraid to die because somebody came back from the dead and said, you know what? I will get you up. I will get you going. Look at this scripture. This scripture says, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. It prophesied that was, that was going to happen. He died. He was buried. That's pretty permanent, yes? And then he was raised from the dead on the third day. That's Easter. Good Friday is when he was buried. Easter is when he was raised. And he was seen by Peter and then by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at, at one time in one place. Most of them are still alive now, according to that particular time in scripture, though some of them might have died. Then he said he was seen by James and later on by all the apostles. And then he says, Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 8, he says, I saw him too. I saw him too. I witness accounts of those who saw Jesus, walked with Christ and actually found Christ to be alive. The same Jesus who they knew before death was a greater Jesus after death because now he was able to take them through that. We are no longer afraid to die because we know what's coming. taught the sun where to stand in the morning who told the ocean you can only come this far and who showed the moon where
notes this is another one I have for you we now have God's spirit living inside us my friend if you understand what this means it will blow your mind we now have God's spirit living inside us we don't follow something we don't just live a certain kind of a lifestyle instructed to us we don't have a hope of something that will be everything that we have is a have right now Everything that we are is an are right now. We are saints even though we are becoming pure. We are saved even though we will one day be saved completely from this world and from sin and from damage and from pain and suffering. We are in a relationship with Christ. We are right with God. Everything we have is an are right now. We have because of what Jesus has done for us. All because Christ lives in us. His spirit lives in us. Look at what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he comes upon you, you will receive power. See, two things you get from the Holy Spirit, holiness and spirit. You get power. And that, 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 that makes all the difference. It changes your life. It changes the momentum of your life. It changes the drive of your life. He says, you will receive power. And you're going to tell people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You are going to be witnesses for me. Look, look at this other scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. He says, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those of who believe in him. I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe in him. It is the same, oh I love this, it is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. It is the same power. So Christ went to the grave and the Bible says God put him there. Christ rose from the grave and the Bible says God rose him up from the dead. And when we believe that Jesus went into the grave and he rose from the dead, we also believe that the spirit of God that did that in Christ also lives in us. My friend, I'm inviting you to a faith in a person who has died and risen again. Faith in a person who says the same spirit that rose me from the dead is going to live in you. Can you imagine? You struggle to get out of bed. You struggle with loneliness. You struggle with relationships. You and I struggle with the world and with flesh and with sickness and with cancer and with aches and pains and all sorts of things. But God has said, I'm putting my spirit in you. And if Jesus rose from the dead, you will rise. You will rise. That's a promise. That's hope. Write this down. God will never stop loving us. That's a hope. God will never stop loving us. Why? Because nothing we ever did got his love for us. Nothing we do will ever lose his love for us. I could never do anything for anything to come between me and God again. Christ has removed absolutely everything and allowed his love to flow in our direction 100% forever. God said in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3, it says, I have loved you with an everlasting eternal love. It's not a love that's feeling based. It's not a love that's contractual. It's not a love as long as you do this or as long as I do this or if this case uh, persists. It's a love of everlasting worth. John 3, 16, you should know this. 16 and 17 says this. For God so loved in this manner, loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There it is, have you have eternal life. If you have eternal life, you have God's love forever. Nothing will ever come between you and God again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God can love those who are right with him. 
God can uh, give his love to those who are right with him. You can only enjoy God's love when you're right with God. So Christ has taken away from between you and God anything that might come between you, which is anything that might anger him, anything that might offend him, which is your sin. Christ has dealt with that. And because that has been removed once and for all, 2000 years before you could even hear this message, Christ has now secured God's love toward you forever, forever. Look at this verse. It says in 1 John chapter 3 verse 10 and 11. 1 John chapter 3 verse 10 and 11. He says, this is how we know we are the children of God. This is how we know we belong to him. This is how we know we are deeply loved. Anyone who does not obey God's command, doesn't love others, is not a child of God. This is the message we have heard from the beginning. We must love each other. So God's love pours in us, through us and to others. And in that we are confident that we have God's love. Do you feel God's love for you? Do you know God's love for you? Are you allowing God's love to flow through you, to people around you, through giving and forgiveness and generosity? Then God's love is coming to you. God's love has been perfected as the scripture says in you. My friend, nothing will ever stop God's love in your direction. Nothing can come between you and God again. And that's hope.
This is one of my favorites. This changed my life when I was around 17, 18 years old and I found that God had a purpose for my life. When I found that God had a plan for my life and that his plan for my life was not incumbent on how good I was, how smart I was, how accomplished I was, it was all about what he could do through me. It blew my mind. I handed my life over to him and it's never been the same again. This point, this thing I want you to remember is this. We know the purposes we were created for. The purposes of God for us are not a discovery. The purposes of God for us are not something you research. It's not something that you, you uncover or you discover. The purposes of God are revealed in clear black and white. In the most loving tones, God tells you, this is why I created you. This is why I made you. This is who you are. You are my child. You are my son. Here's a world. Here are talents. Here's love. Here's what you can do with it. The Bible says the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me because his love endures forever. He's a loving God. He's not going to waste your life wading through the dark, wading through confusion, trying to figure out what this life is all about. And you get to 40, 50, 60, and then finally you kind of figure out what you're going to do with your life. And now you don't have the strength, the energy, or the friends to do it with. God wants you to enjoy every single day of your life lived on purpose for his purposes. He says he will fulfill his purpose through me. Most of you know this verse, Jeremiah 29 verse 11. He says, I know the plans I have for you. God says, I know the plans I have for you. I mean, that's where it becomes so important to spend time with him, to know him, to know everyday plans, to get your marching orders from him. To say, yes, sir, no, sir, I'm going to get it done, sir. Plans to prosper you. Plans to not to harm you, but to give you a hope, to give you a future. I want you to live the best you could live so that what you do with this life will result in what I do with your eternal life, God says. In fact, Jesus said, my purpose is to give life to you in fullness. There is no uh, guessing in the Christian life. The life in Christ, there is no guessing, there is no wondering, there is no discovery, there is only revelation. There is only revelation. Look at what Romans chapter 8 says. It says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Have been called according to his purpose. You see, everybody's been called according to his purpose, but not everybody responds. Today, you're going to decide whether you want to respond, whether you're going to live your life based on his purposes. But your life is scripted. Your life is planned by a loving God, an intelligent God, a creative God, an all-powerful God. And that God wants you to live that life in relationship with Him, in fellowship with Him, in sync with Him. Would you like that? Would you like to do that? Now that Jesus has removed your sin, He has removed the penalty of your sin, and He's brought you into a right standing with God, would you like to carry on your life living right for Him? enjoying a guilt-free life. Would you like to do that? Would you like to know his plans for your life so that every relationship matters, every day matters, even pain and suffering matter, and there's meaning in everything you do? I invite you to that life because God has given you a life filled with hope. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, he says, For me, living is for Christ, and dying is even better. So whether I live or die, I win. Paul says, in Christ, I win, and that's hope. All right, let me just give you one more. Are you ready for this? I hope you haven't forgotten these. I hope that you'll stop and go over them. I hope you've written it down somewhere so that you allow it to change your life like it's changed mine and millions of others. Because the life Christ offers never leaves you the same. It never leaves you looking the same, feeling the same, or valuing life the same. It's going to change your life. Let me give you a sixth. We have an eternal home waiting for us. We have an eternal home. With that, my friends, is a life-altering perspective about death and beyond. That is life. And we were talking about death and resurrection on Easter. Good Friday, Jesus died. Easter Sunday, Jesus rose again. On one day, Jesus died. On the third day, he rose again. That's it. For him, it's a doorway. He has made death for you and me a doorway. We drop this tetra pack to the ground. It corrodes to dust. And he says, if, if I live, you will live also. 
He says, if I rose again, you're going to rise again also. The same spirit of God that raised me from the dead is going to raise you from the dead. My friends, you've got to understand this. You've got to understand this is not religion. This is not religion. This is revelation straight from the heart of a loving God. And he wants you to receive that revelation with belief, with faith. Look at what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We have been born into a new life. We have been born in a new life which has an inheritance that cannot be destroyed or corrupted. Now where is that? It's in your afterlife. It's, in the, it's, in, it's past the door of this life into the next. What God really values. That's the life God really has for you. That's what God wants for you because that's where he'll be walking and talking with you. As long as you're here on this earth, it's an assignment. It's a temporary life. And you are here to learn, to believe, to respond to, in faith to what God has for you. You are here to show your sense of faith and responsibility and stewardship with what God gives you. And based on that, God wants to give you an eternity of joy and peace in heaven. That inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Underline that. That, that is your names on that inheritance. It's kept in heaven for you. Here's another one to add to your faith today. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. No eye has seen. No ear has heard. No mind has imagined the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. Back. For those who love him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived the wonderful things God has prepared for. See, God has everything planned, stored for you in the future. He wants to give you what he wants to give you in the future. Why? Because in the future, it will last. In the future, it will be eternal. In the future, past death and beyond, it will be forever and ever. And that's the eternity, the life God has planned for you. You and I are too focused on this world, on this life, on this body, on this looks, on this career. We're just too focused on that. Rightly so, because that's as far as we can see. But eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has in plan. So when you snap out of this world and this perspective and say, God, what do you have planned for me? What do you want me to do? What are your purposes? for my life. God, I want to step out of the ordinary. I want to step out of this mundane lifestyle. I want to live a life that's going to last and impact and send reverberations through eternity. I want to take people with me. I want to affect people for good. I want to be a blessing to people. I want to meet those people in heaven that I was a blessing to. Oh man, God, if there's a better life and if there's a longer life, a longer lasting life with greater impact, give it to me. I want it. And Jesus says, here it is. I have come that you should have life to the full. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened so that you may see and understand the hope to which God has called you. The hope to which God has called you. The Bible says makes it very simple. He makes it as simple as a right relationship with God. It's as simple as that. You don't have to figure this life out. You don't have to discover it. You don't have to uncover it. You don't have to work out the problems. You don't have to fix yourself. My friend, you're listening to me right now. It's as simple as this. He says, if you confess with your mouth, say it. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God sent Jesus to the grave for you and God raised Jesus from the dead for you, you will be saved. You will be saved. And that is the word of God. And the word of God gives you hope. You will be saved. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, those are the two things. Life hinges around this. Eternity hinges around this. It's not your character. It's not your, your competence. It's not your corruption. It's not your brokenness that is going to get you heaven and life uh, uh, everlasting. It is your faith statement, your believing that Christ did it for you. Today, my friends, I challenge you to believe that. I don't know what you've believed all your life. I don't know what you've followed all your life. But today, on this beautiful Easter morning, I want to present to you what is known as the gospel. That God loved the world. Everyone in the world. God knew we were sinners. 
God was offended by our sin, but God sent Jesus to take the penalty of our sin, to take the guilt of our hearts, and God used his blood to wash us clean. And because God took care of justice, because the wages of sin is death, God now is able to take care of just you. God is able to take care of of your life and your future. God is able to love you endlessly, uh, no holds barred. He's able to love you. He's able to give you everything he's ever had. And that is his plan for your life. Not just to forgive you, but to let you back in. Not just to let you back in, but to embrace you. Not just to embrace you, but to give you everything he has forever and ever and ever. This life, few years, few decades. But what God has planned for you is eternal. And Jesus said, if I live, you'll live. He says, don't worry about those who died. Even if they died, they will live if they believed in me. For I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. And when Jesus makes a statement, it comes from his godness. It comes from his eternality. It comes from a person who has defeated death. And if there's no death, there's no end. And if there's Jesus, there's never going to be an end. Will you accept Jesus? Will you acknowledge him as your savior from your sin and the Lord of your life? And will you bow your knee, your back, your mind and your ego to the Lord Jesus Christ so that he from today onward, from this Easter onward, becomes the Lord of your life. No, don't look to the left or the right. Don't look at anybody else. It's not their faith that ever saved you or changed your life. Jesus did everything he did for you. And now that he's done everything he's done for you, given everything he could give for you, will you give up everything for him? No, this is not popular. No, this is not, this is not something that everybody's going to come running and, hey, I want, I want. But there'll be the one or two. There'll be the few. There'll be the you. That says, I, I can feel God talking to me right now. I know what you're saying is true. I'm all in, but I'm not all there. I don't get what, what all is going to be part of this. I don't know, but I'm ready. I'm ready. Where do I sign up? And if that's you, text me. There's a number on the screen. Email me. There's an email on the screen. Just drop a message. Get in touch. Come to church. Join us and grow with us. Because that's what it's all about. Not about this life. It's about eternity. It's about getting others to go with us. Let's live for Jesus. And that is hope. Long ago he blessed the earth born older than the years and in the stall the cross he saw was the first of many tears a life of homeless wandering cast out in sorrow's way the shepherd seeking for the loss his life the price he'll pay love crucified arose the risen one in splendor Jehovah's soul defender, he has won the victory. Love crucified arose, and the grave became a place of hope. For the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again. Throughout your life you felt the weight of what you came to give. To drink for us that crimson cup So that we might really live At last the time to love and die That dark appointed day That one forsaken moment when The Father turned His face away Love crucified arose The risen one in splendor Jehovah's soul defender He has won the victory. Love crucified arose, and the grave became a place of hope. For the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again. Love crucified arose, the risen one in splendor. 
Jehovah's sole defender. He has won the victory. The love crucified rose. And the grave became a place of hope. For the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again. Is beating once again. Love crucified rose. Thank you so much for being with us. I am so glad you joined us. What a privilege. What an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And you know what? If we get a chance to meet you, uh, if we get a chance to connect with you, we would love that. Join us. Grow with us. That's what this connection is all about today. So I look forward to seeing you. Come join us at church or hearing from you. Have a wonderful rest of the Easter. And may the Lord bless this year ahead. May the risen Christ change your life. God bless you. Bye-bye.